Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome AIDS research pioneer, Dr. Robert Gallo, whose global virus network is now focused on seeking answers to the mysteries of COVID-19. Now, here's Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. Dr. Robert Gallo is one of the world's preeminent virus hunters and his experience and perspective are needed more than ever as the world fights COVID and the Omicron variant. His accomplishments as co-discoverer of HIV as the cause of AIDS means he can provide us with important insight about Omicron. In fact, the South African scientist who detected Omicron variant says it probably incubated in a body of a person with an immune system affected by HIV or another immune compromising condition. Dr. Gallo was portrayed by Alan Alda in the movie and the band played on. Today, he's the co-founder and director of the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, as well as the co-founder and international scientific advisor to the Global Virus Network. And Dr. Gallo, we're so glad to have you with us today. Well, that's Thank great. you. Ms. And, you know, there was a lot made of the uh, uh, connection between HIV patients in the South African and Omicron. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on it. It made headlines across the country here, probably around the globe. And uh, what insight can you give us uh, on the connection? The first thing is that, and I, I try to use this phrase more than, um, maybe more than I should, but maybe less than I should also. And that's the three words I think we don't use enough. And that's, I don't know. I mm -hmm. mean, I, what, I, what I'm telling you would be opinion. And I hope you know that. I mean, so, and what they're telling you is obviously an interpretation. It's an opinion. Any RNA virus mutates a lot, all of them, whether it's HIV or, which is hard to transmit because HIV has very few target cells. So you can't compare the two pandemics, except for public health things and forget and, and for notions like let's not forget, because we always forget after a generation, we forget. No matter what how bad things are, we forget. Already people are forgetting HIV until this thing hit. I've heard commentators and public health people not even listed in the in the pan, the great pandemics of the century when it's still ongoing to, to a certain extent. So any one of these viruses that's an RNA virus and particularly coronaviruses have a chance to undergo great genetic change rapidly. So think of like a slot machine with the numbers coming out and you're waiting for your pattern to come, you know, stop this one works better, you know, they keep changing and keep changing and keep changing and testing the water. So when you get infected by an RNA virus, the term quasi species has been used. It's not, you know, when you get infected, you get a, an amount of virus, not one particle. But within the RNA viruses, there is extreme variation. And once they infect, the clock starts going and you're changing all the time and looking for things to do better and better and better. It's, that's the nature of this beast. Now, this one is exceptional. That is to say, SARS coronavirus 2 in itself is exceptional. And in that, we have a greater exception with this Omicron, whatever, however they want to pronounce this Greek letter. Uh, so it's, it's truly a major genetic change of the kind that usually would take uh, really much longer, if ever, to reach this amount. So it does look, if you had to take a guess, that something has impacted this other than its usual terrific mutation rate. Um, so to answer your question, I can only speculate it is not unreasonable. There are many HIV-infected people, most since uh, George, President George W. Bush created the president's emergency program for AIDS relief. Most of them didn't have any therapy. And then there was resistance by Mabeki, who didn't believe in AIDS or want to believe in AIDS. So they were way behind in getting treatment. But certainly today, with that program and other programs of helping Africa, most people today get a crack at good therapy. Yet the number of HIV infected people is very high in South Africa still. And so it is a rational thought that mm -hmm. certainly without, without a good immune system, this thing is going to be replicating more and more uh, and uh, have a chance to mutate more and more. The other way of looking at it is when you do have a good immune system is that this guy tends to evolve away and, and mutate elsewhere because of the immune pressure on him. But we haven't seen to document cases where someone has virtually no immune system. 
And if you're an untreated AIDS patient, you don't have much immunity. So I would love to see this be proven. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if they can go back and get to a patient right at the beginning, it would be fascinating to know that. Right. Um, I wouldn't want to be in a laboratory working with this in the presence of HIV. Mm -hmm. So it's a reasonable idea, but certainly not a proven one. Well, Dr. Gallo, uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Marwan Haddad here at Community Health Center and the Weizmann Institute is now the chair of the HIV Medicine Association. And we've uh, been engaged uh, in the HIV epidemic and work uh, for, gosh, I guess it's 30 years at this point. You know, we're hearing in our support groups and in the various uh, circles that we have for our patients who live uh, with the virus that this is this most recent news is really kind of the push it to the edge in terms of worry and anxiety. And I, I'd like to ask, what would your best advice, or, or perhaps Dr. Karim, I think you, uh, your colleague in South Africa, what would your best advice be? Should, should people living with HIV be engaging in even more social distancing and masking than other people or stay the course, get vaccinated, be prudent, anything advice that you would have for patients living with the virus right now? Well, first of all, before answering that, we yet don't know how serious this is. I mean, we're getting headlines everywhere because of its movement, right? It's infection. Remember, we get infected with seasonal coronaviruses a lot. These are, they cause virtually nothing, maybe a mild common cold, maybe sometimes more severe. So we don't yet know how dangerous this is in terms of what happens to the infected person. I would say, we're about a week away, maybe 10 days or so, from having certain answers. One is about the efficiency of the, the current vaccines. And if they're not so efficient, they'll be able to modify the vaccine approach a little bit, and it'll take a few months, and they'll come out with a better one. But the question is, is it, a, is it better to be dominated by this one? We don't yet have enough disease stories yet. I, no one knows how how, uh, let's call it deadly this is, or if not deadly, provoking serious illness. We don't know that yet. And we don't have the animal models ready yet. I would say, once again, we're probably about maybe one to two weeks away from having decent animal models in different parts of the world. What would you advise those people? Just as you already know, and you already think, and you're, you want me to say to somebody who might be listening, of course, they need, the person with HIV infection with a virus that's dangerous, that's respiratory in nature, coming in with a lower immune system, particularly if your treatment is not on top of things, or, or you're new in treatment or anything like it, uh, this would possibly be catastrophic, right? So yeah, if I had HIV infection, I'd wanna be a little extra cautious. What it means is I sure wanna know who I was hanging around with. I sure wanna be vaccinated to the ability that I can be. I might wanna stimulate my innate immune system of interferon and natural killer cells. There are ways of doing that. I don't think we should, maybe should get into that, but non-specific vaccines, I'll just say a word about it, like measles, mumps, rubella that are live, can really stimulate the immune system, do no harm to you. That might be helpful. Hmm. Um, but that's an old story. That's a big scientific area that I'm exploring and pushing. And then um, you want to be with people who are vaccinated, with people that are cautious as best you can. You're not going to hibernate, but you better be careful in crowds and doors. And yeah, sure, you should wear a mask if you're oh. HIV infected. I would, I would think you'd be doing that anyway in, when you travel if you're HIV infected. Well, that's a, that's so, a great, yeah. that's a great roadmap. And you know, I want to uh, pull the thread a little on. You said you have pulled together the global uh, virus network, uh, and there was a recent conference there. A couple things, you know, obviously we want to know what were the big lessons learned, but also uh, we really need a global solution to these problems. And I'm wondering, in the early part of the uh, virus in the 2020 era, was the global virus network able to work together? Or uh, it seemed like uh, the United States at least tried to go its own way with a couple of these international groups. And I know a lot of people have been 
critical of, of that decision, but uh, tell us a little more about how you kept this network together during those times. Well, when, don't say me, because I was a lot of help and the president of the Global Virus Network that we recruited, I, I actively recruited him about five years ago. Christian Brichot used to be president of Pasteur Institute in Paris and president of INSERM, which is like their NIH that funds the various science and medicine for France. Um, then he's been uh, a head of the Mariu uh, Institute, which is a public health uh, grounded uh, private organization headed by Elaine Mariu, his family has been involved for 100 years in public health. So we, the GVN is pretty strong right now with corporate relationships and with 66 centers throughout the world of excellence in virology. We cover every single kind of virus that there's known to be able to cause human disease. So we have expertise in just about everything and we can have that contact immediately. And yes, we had meetings with, before you had heard things, we were talking to, GVN people in China, mm. as well as in Singapore, experts on the coronaviruses. So we kind of knew what was coming. We knew ahead of time that they were going to publish the sequence of the entire genome, which they did on January 10th, despite being criticized for being too slow. We have the sequence and could predict that the antibodies won't last, that a vaccine cannot last more than five to seven months was our prediction back in January. But you know, you can't say that too loud. And because that'll even cause people to be more reluctant to do things they won't understand fully. So you don't say everything that you know, but yes, I think to get to your point, really, if you said, I wanna to listen to government, you, let's start by saying, well, which one? The government's all different. Japan did nothing. Sweden said we should have herd immunity. I was shocked by that. Um, Boris Johnson, um, Russia, uh, President Trump, I mean, who do we listen to? And why should I be restricted in my knowledge base about what one or two government scientists want to say, even if I know them, even if we're friends? Because I have access to the globe. I mean, I'm not good. So I think there has to be a bigger role for private organizations without any question. Mm -hmm. In some way linked with WHO and linked among themselves. I gave a talk at, I, I didn't know it before, something like Council of Society uh, for Science Presidents or something like that, CSSP. And I got a lot of offers to help us in the Global Virus Network. Because I, that's one of my conclusions. We need government. We need government for money. We need government for oversight. And really, I would say for final decisions. But I don't need them for my sole source of scientific information. My God. I mean, I, I don't want to go through it. I mean, you know, that's not not what we're here for. I don't want to mm -hmm. say where, where I think mistakes scientifically were made, but then they, they're not limited to government, but we need not to be limited by a few people. I mean, that, that's just r ridiculous that I got to hear the news all the time, the same people, same at, at level of expertise, which gets highlighted as the super expertise, but it's the, not the reality, you know? So, uh, in, and it's not the reality me. The reality is we need the best on each category of virus all over the world in communication. So, you know, I, it's which president do you listen to, right? That's, That's the right. point. Mexico, Brazil, mm -hmm. America, Sweden, <clears throat> Japan, England, they all went their separate ways. And then they'll have meetings and things like that. But they did what they wanted. I, 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 I would never, you know, when I go out, I, I really want to say that's a real lesson in all of this. Yeah. I mean, right. in all the pandemics. Sure, we need government. Sure, they have good science and sometimes not so good science. But please, let's not be restricted to government. Great. Well, Dr. Gallo, we, uh, we really have followed your writing on that subject, and I think you've made great points. I guess the, uh, the question we have is, it might have been better on this round if the NGOs had, had played a greater role we're almost certain we're gonna be back in this situation again at some point in the future with other pandemics. And, and what's, the, uh, what's the, the lineup in, in your perspective? What is that organization or what is that group of organizations that can speak uh, you know, with, with the science and, and you know, some authority about the direction we should take as a, as a global society, not just uh, individual well nations? Well, I don't want to say the global virus network alone, far from it. 
but obviously that's a good beginning. Mm -hmm. It's 66 centers of excellence in virology all over the world in every single continent except, well, not Antarctica and Antarctica, no, but everywhere else. I mean, within Australia, significantly involved Japan, China, Russia. I didn't want to make it related to government because we wanted China and Japan to be involved too. Yeah. And they are involved. Yeah. In fact, we just accepted two major centers from Russia only last week. Uh, my son Marcus is involved in searching for what are the centers that we really need, what part of the world, how do we do it? We get an input to him and so on, but he's active on this all the time. So, you know, we have some in Brazil, we have several in South America. We don't have anything in Central America. Um, you know, many in the United States, Europe, um, et cetera. And Africa, yes, several in Africa. You know, really high qualified, and they're getting more qualified by the minute in Africa, you'd be really surprised how good they're becoming. But also we have those centers that are not called centers of excellence, but we're trying to make them on the way toward. We have some in India, we have some in Africa, we have some in South America, we have some in Southeast Asia. Um, but we also have center of excellence in India as well. So I feel the advantage to us is we learn early of what's cooking on the ground. You know, that's important. And the second advantage is uh, if we had the money, you know, it had to have a room with a big wall with lights on it of where in the world of where we have a center. And then we have like, if you press the second light, what that center does and its expertise, you get to know in time. And, you know, when you knew people anyway in advance, or you wouldn't have called that center because you knew they had somebody well-known who was an expert. We started with some flu people. We have the best flu guys that you can imagine. So I think we could press that button and have, access to a new disease comes it's gastrointestinal it's coming out of egypt we're sending soldiers there to help egypt with something you know what are they going to do when they face there you know i press a button gastrointestinal viruses who do we have on earth that's the most expert and who closest to uh, the country egypt as well and then we try to get funding to help and see what we could do so the gvn does advocacy uh -huh. it does training for young virologists how do you know that how do you go into virology you go into it by chance. You hear a lecture. That's what you know. I went in because I played tennis with a Chinese guy who was a very good, uh, a very good uh, virologist, and convinced me if I was interested in leukemia and cancer that these certain kind of viruses, known as retroviruses, which HIV is an example, uh, are often involved in leukemia. He got me going in that direction. I never had formal training in virology, but I start paying attention. Then I start to go into lectures, and then I start working on it and little by little. I got more and more into virology. This is chance. Well, we shouldn't do it by chance only. Well, so that, the GVN primary purpose is training new young virologists, advocacy, and then um, education would be the first one. I'm thinking of the other A. At, oh, boy. Um, I'm forgetting one of the major things that the GVN does, and it starts with A. We always list it as advocacy, training, and well, what's we'll, the other A? We'll get back to that. That must have been the most consequential tennis match in uh, history. So we're, <laughs> we're glad it happened. And, uh, you know, I noted in the Baltimore Sun interview you gave in April, a real spot on prediction of where we'd be now. And you, you'd mentioned variants and boosters at that time. And we've heard from Dr. Scott Gottlieb, uh, who said the pandemic could be over in the United States by January. But others say Omicron will dominate and overwhelm the world in 2022. I'm wondering what your thoughts are right now as you sort of look, look out on the horizon. Clearly that's happening. So it's not exactly a profit to say that that's going to overwhelm. It's happening right now. But what, I happen, what will be true in a year from now? I haven't the foggiest notion. Will there be another variant? Will this guy, will this guy burn out to some extent um, with heavy focus on it? It's hard to predict. It's really hard to know. And I don't think we should predict when we don't know. I could, you could predict that right now it is going to be overwhelming for a lot of nations. That's mm -hmm. true. But again, we don't know how serious a disease it's causing. Maybe that's not such a bad, bad thing, right? Maybe it'll induce a good immune response and maybe it won't kill. Do we know that this is killing people yet? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, you know, you got to hold on a little bit rather than too much. It's a little premature to predict. It's not like when we saw the, the genome of published by the Chinese, the genetic sequence, and looked at the spike sequence, we could make a rational prediction. 
we know the spike protein is going to have a lot of sugar on it, certain things called mannose. And from our previous experience with HIV, flu, and other things, when that happens, the cells that make antibodies are B cells, lymphocytes called B lymphocytes. Those cells selected to target to make antibodies to such a thing. We know, we don't know exactly why, and we're studying it, don't live long to become mature. Well, I shouldn't say they don't live long. They don't mature to proper what we call plasma cells that are the most mature cells that make antibodies that last a very long time, like your lifetime, like with papillomavirus mm -hmm. vaccines or measles, mm -hmm. mumps, rubella, polio, smallpox. They last your lifetime. So we said that back in January. This won't last more than six months. We'll need boosting and boosting. We're going to, you know, so you can make rational dis predictions. It's too early to predict what's going to happen in a year mm -hmm. from now. We don't know enough about this fellow yet, other than it replicates like heck and has an amazing amount of genetic modification in it compared to the other. You know, Dr. Gallo, I, uh, I was stunned by how quickly we had the vaccine uh, for COVID. You know, we gave our, our first vaccines uh, here in our organization the last week in December, just a year ago. And that was what, 10 months, nine months after uh, this really hit our shores. And yet, you know, I, I, I've been wanting to ask you, uh, you know, here we are 30 years of responding to the HIV epidemic and we still don't have that vaccine. I just have to ask you, what's your thoughts on whether we're going to have sure. a vaccine for sure. HIV sometime in our imaginable near future? I gave a lecture on World AIDS Day, December 1, at the Gladstone Institute of University of California, San Francisco. They recorded it. It should be available. Watch that lecture. Rather than me try to answer in 30 seconds, but what I can say is this. Viruses are not the same. And of all things, for an RNA virus, HIV is super unique. Super unique. Why? With an RNA virus, respiratory, like coronaviruses, like flu, it's not a discovery to find the virus. It's dripping out of your nose and your mouth. It's obvious it's causing the disease. It's highly infectious. HIV is very poorly infectious. It takes body fluid. And by the time you get the disease, it's 10 years after you're infected. There was no way to recognize it. And by the time you get the disease, you have hardly any T cells in your blood where we were looking for virus. So it's very hard to find. With a respiratory virus like SARS coronavirus too, one day, you know, <laughs> you just take the swab off the nose and you can see it under the electron microscope or do a test for foreign RNA and you'll see a viral sequence come out in one day or two days. Certainly in a week, you'll know the cause. Not a big deal. Vaccine? What respiratory virus acute do we not have a vaccine where we've tried? I mean, we have, you know, we have a lot of vaccines against these kind of viruses. It's not a big problem. But, but sure, this was rapid. That's because of the messenger RNA new technology. But everybody knew we'd have a vaccine for this, that it wouldn't be problematic. No question it would respond to antibodies, typical. This is far from the case with HIV. When HIV infects, less than 24 hours later, its genes are in you and me and anybody who's a target, in our chromosomes, in our DNA forever, right? So right off the bat, there's no time for an immune recall. You get infected, you're going to be, you, the virus comes in and you're, you, you, you're going to get a, takes what, a few weeks to make antibodies. And if you've already been vaccinated, it'll still take a few days. By that time, this virus is integrating and making variants already and harming your immune system at the same time. Okay? And, and, and you know the virus exists in this latent state where there's no virus to be seen. It's in the genes of you. And it pops out periodically when it feels like it, huh? So it's a completely different story. Moreover, it, no one has been able to raise the antibodies to the, price, the right level. If you're going to go on an antibody-based vaccine, you can't get the titer. You can't get the breadth to cover all the variants of the virus. When they vary, it's not like just minor changes that occur with SARS coronavirus too but you're changing some things that make it no longer recognizable to the envelope protein outside. It escapes right away. 
So it has really tricky ways of avoiding the immune system. And I mentioned already, it's one of the viruses that the antibodies don't last, similar to similar to SARS coronavirus too, similar to the COVID cause. It doesn't last. They'll last about five months, six months in primate studies when we, even when we get an effect, it doesn't last very long. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you always want to get your cells, immune response, we call it, right? They're called T cells, right? And you'd like your T cells to respond also, not just antibodies. In fact, without T cells helping to make antibodies, they're called T helper cells, you don't get antibodies. But when you make a T cell do that, yeah, it has to be what we call activated. It's in a different metabolic state. It's an activated T cell doing its function. But where does HIV go? It goes into exactly those cells. Hmm. So while you're doing that, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're making more houses for HIV. In which case, you might have a vaccine that, that went through the first phase of solving the problem, but you never know it because your CD4 T cells are getting infected. More, not less, because you made more houses for the virus. So there's a number of hurdles. In fact, I've changed, as I said in my talk, I didn't say this publicly before, I think I have been wrong, and the field is wrong, and the field is hyper-funding only major consortia instead of looking for creative new young scientists, two big consortia all doing the same thing. West Coast, East Coast, with many groups that are getting funded from those groups that are funded by NIH. So what do they concentrate on? Just, just as if it, was, if it was the same as the COVID-19 virus. That is neutralizing antibodies. Well, we don't reach the titer that's needed. We don't reach the breadth that's needed. This is 35 years going down. Going, it can be 40 years very soon. Yeah. That's been going. It's 37 years. And uh, the first paper on neutralizing antibodies was my colleague Marjorie Guroff and myself in Nature. And the field focuses only on that, uh, almost, almost only. And I said at Gladstone UCSF that I think this pathway is wrong. The mass funding in one direction is wrong. I think we need a lot more creative thought on this, a lot more individual investigator-initiated grants. And I think I was personally wrong. You have to, you have to emphasize that because when you're critical, so that I emphasize too much antibodies in the early thing, I think it's going to be by cellular immunology mm -hmm. if we ever get an answer. And wow. I think it's possible and that we will, but I mean, by that time, I'll probably be somewhere between Pluto and Mercury. I don't know. Well, well, let let uh, we will make sure our listeners have that uh, link to the Gladstone uh, 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 presentation that you made. I want to switch over though on vaccines to the mRNA platform, which has been successful in terms of the Pfizer and Moderna effort. And what's your thought about yeah, how? They're successful for whom? Successful for whom? For well, I mean, me. it, it seems to have better efficacy than perhaps some of the yes, other. Yes, for us, for us, but yeah. we don't get it out to people yet, right? No, no, there's no no question about the global. But I, <laughs> I wonder, what are you seeing out in terms of other research that's going on now on autoimmune uh, uh, diseases and uh, uh, other cancer that's happening with the mRNA? Are you following that at all, or anything you want to share yes, with people yes. about your I, hope I, for? I, 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 I follow it, Mark, but I'm not the best person on earth or best person in our country to make that um, best interpretation of that. But of course, I follow it to some extent. And I think, yeah, I think there's reasonable things in cancer. I don't, I, I don't expect home runs from it. Mm -hmm. My former postdoc, who's senior scientist now at NIH, has been well funded to do it for HIV. What I said to him is I... I mean, I hope I'm wrong. I don't think it will mean a hill of beans for HIV because it's, the, it's not the method and the speed there. It's what's in the package. And I don't think using just the envelope protein, it's not what we call the spike protein, it's the same function, what, what, what grabs onto the cell when it infects. I don't think uh, just producing it by messenger RNA is going to make things seriously better. I, I hope I'm wrong. Um, and, but I, I just don't see it yet, but for some things, yeah, it's going to make a difference. And for some other viruses, it's going to make a difference. But I, 
But if, my, if I were running a company, my first thought wouldn't be HIV, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Great. We've been speaking today with Dr. Robert Gallo. He's the co-founder and director of the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He's also the co-founder and international scientific advisor to the Global Virus Network. Follow him on Twitter at Dr. Robert C. Gallo. Dr. Gallo, I want to thank you uh, for your brilliant work and your straight talk and for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. Take care. All right. Bye -bye. Thanks Bye -bye. so much, Doc. Bye.